Thank you for tuning in today. We believe that the Word of God is designed and has the ability to radically change your life. This series, Think Rich, Live Wealthy, is designed to change the way you think concerning finances and the life that you're living so that you can enjoy everything that God not only has promised for you, but everything that He has you living in today. Thank you for tuning in. Hope you enjoy the message. I'm so glad that you came out tonight. And for those of you who are streaming, I'm excited that you decided to listen in on the message tonight because God is such an awesome God and he always has something for his people. God always has food for us to eat. We just have to realize his food and take it and eat it, chew on it, chew on it. Make sure that you get it all chewed well so that it can digest well. Hallelujah. And give us the outcome that God desires. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, uh, when I was praying and uh, asking God, you know, what do you want me to uh, talk about or what do you want to say? That's pretty much what I ask God. What do you want to say? There's a lot of stuff I can talk about, but what do you, what do you want to say? Uh, and he said to me, inheritance. I said, inheritance? He said, yes, inheritance. He said, when you get born again, he said, you inherit some things. And when you inherit something, that means something like a legacy. Uh, it means an endowment. It means something that's been bestowed upon you. It means provision. It means a birthright. See, I like that one, a birthright. It's legally yours. Uh, it's a heritage. Uh, it's the assumption of something. Uh, it's elevation as well. Well, when we come into the kingdom of God, we inherit some things. And we are God's heritage, but we inherit some things. And we've come into an inheritance. Sometimes um, we don't realize how big and how large it is. I think it's probably so big, actually, that it's very difficult to even articulate the inheritance that we have come into. We can... Sometimes we can um, sense it in our being that there's something so much greater than what we see right now, something so much greater than what we've even experienced right now. A lot of times I hear people say, you know, we're just at the tip of the iceberg. But you know what? I'm tired of being at the tip of the iceberg. I mean, I, mean, I, I want to think that I've moved on a little bit further. Uh, so I don't feel like, you know, all these years I've been praying and been fasting and been reading, I'm just at the tip of it, but I'm saying that it's so much more, it's so much greater uh, that I don't believe, again, that sometimes we have the word to articulate what we feel and what we sense and what we've experienced. Have you, have God ever done something for you that you just became speechless? It's like, I wish I could find the words, but you just don't know. I'm trying to tell you how good God is, but I just can't find no words. The only thing I do is have this big old, big old grin on my face. You know, I can high five you. I can, I can roll off a whole bunch of adjectives, but when I get done, I still have not been able to explain to you what happened to me. And so God wants us uh, uh, not to just know it in senses. I don't, I don't think we can actually even begin to articulate it until we actually experience it. And that's where God wants us to be. He wants us to be a place of experiencing him, experiencing the inheritance that we have come into. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 54. Isaiah chapter 54, and let us look at verse 17. Isaiah 54 and verse 17. And I'm going to read this out of the um, easy reading version, just so that we can just change up some of the words. But you all know, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. But this is what, this is how it reads. It says, people will make weapons to fight against you, but their weapons will not defeat you. Some people will say things against you, but anyone who speaks against you will be proved wrong. The Lord says, that is what my servants get. They get the good things that come from me, their Lord. And see, when you read it out of the King James Version, it says it's an inheritance. He said, this is a part of our inheritance, that God is going to be our defender, that God is going to be our protector. He said, things can happen, but understand, I'm the one who's going to bring you to victory. So don't even pay any attention to that because it's a part of your heritage. It's a part of who you are. I call you victorious people because you're my people. 
mm, God is so good, is he not? Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. Let's read this in the Amplified. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. Because there's some things we just need to uh, remember sometimes. He says, we are assured. I like that. We are assured and know that God being a partner in their labor, all things work together and are fitting into a plan for good. It's fitting into a plan for good. Why? Because this is a part of our inheritance. He says, fitting together for our good. He says, and for those who love him, let me read it all because we got to get it all together. We are assured and know that God being a partner in their labor, all things work together and are fitting into a plan for good too. And for those who love God and are called according to his design and purpose. He said, when I called you, I called you to a design and I called you to a purpose. So no matter what is going on, all things are going to work together for your good because this is a part of your heritage. This is a part of your inheritance. So you can't be moved. God is saying, don't be moved. Don't be moved by it. He said, because you come into an inheritance of protection. You come into an inheritance of provision. You come into an inheritance of health. This is something that belongs to you. It's your birthright. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. It's been bestowed upon you. And see, when you get an inheritance, you know, you don't earn an inheritance. It's what other people labored for. And they passing it on. God says, see, now I sent Jesus. And he did everything was necessary so that you can get this. So stop acting like a pauper. Stop acting like you didn't inherit something. Why do you keep acting like I didn't do anything, Jesus said, on that cross? Don't act like I didn't do something before the cross because I took on a lot of stripes. I took on a lot of beating. I took on a lot of, you know, spitting. And you know we don't like for people to spit on us. I took on, a, you know, a lot of whipping, a lot of, you know, people talking about me. He said, you know, they talked about my mama before I even got to the cross. So I'm telling you, I took on a lot of stuff. So stop acting like I didn't do anything. Glory to God. He said, so all things are working together for your good. Look at somebody say, all things are working together for my good. Because it's part of my inheritance. It is a part, it's, 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 it's what I just, you know, I walked into. I mean, you know, I didn't have to labor for it. It's just glory to God. Let's look at Ephesians, Ephesians chapter one, Ephesians chapter one. And we're going to look at verse 11. So we'll stay in the Amplified. It says, in him, we also were made God's heritage portion, and we obtained an inheritance, for we had been foreordained, chosen, and appointed beforehand in accordance with his purpose, who works out everything in agreement with the counsel and design of his own will. God said, I decided this all by myself. I decided it all by myself. I called you into an inheritance. He said, and, and, and he said, it's been ordained. It was my purpose. It's, he, you're not an a, a afterthought. He said, I thought this out very clearly. And I called you into an inheritance. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let's look at John. I just absolutely love this scripture. John chapter 15 and verse 16. And we're reading this out of the Amplified I love this scripture. I'm telling you, I love it. He says, you have not chosen me, but I chose you and I have appointed you. I have planted you. Look at somebody say, I'm planted. I'm pla God didn't see us as like seed. He just threw on the sidewalk or threw on the ground. We're not, we're not like seed that just kind of fell out of the bag and you know, we on. He said, no, I planted you. That means intentional. God is intentional about every one of us. Look at somebody say, you planted? Because God, he said, I planted you. 
Hallelujah. You know, when you plant something, you'll be expecting a harvest. You don't plant something and walk away from it. You plant something and you fertilize it and you, you, you water it. You make sure the ground is okay. You work with it, right? To make sure you get the best harvest out of what it is that you planted. So God said, I planted you. So I don't, I'm not ever leaving you. I'm not walking away and saying, oh, it'll just come up. He says, no, if I, if I see some bugs or something, he said, I'm going to spray some pesticide so I can kill the bugs. He said, when I see you need a little fertilizer, I'm going to make sure you get fed because I'm expecting a harvest. Glory to God. I'm expecting a harvest from what I planted. He said, I planted you that you might go and bear fruit and keep on bearing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Keep on bearing. You know, I, I, I know there's some plants that, uh, you know, I don't work in the yard because of, you know, worms and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but I, th I, think I, ha I think I have this right. There's some stuff called annuals. Yeah. You know, they do once a year, whatever. But you know, when their time is up, you may think that it's dead because it looked like it's not bearing anything. But when the season is right, it comes right back again. See, sometimes we may have a little few seasons like that and I like what it looks like. Look at somebody say, it just looks like. It looked like I'm dead and ain't nothing happening and you know, stuff ain't producing. And you know, you, you, you may think this is this, you know, it's just, I mean, my goodness. See, the thing to do is don't dig it up. Don't dig it up thinking that it's dead. Just because it looks like, look at somebody say, looks like. Just because it looks like you're not producing now, the root is in the ground, and when the season is right, hallelujah. <laughs> Ooh, I'm telling you, we came into some kind of inheritance, didn't we? He said, keep on bearing that your fruit may be lasting that it may remain and abide so that whatever you ask, whatever you ask the Father in my name as presenting all that I am, he may give it to you. He said, don't, don't get all crazy when it looks like things ain't happening for you. He said, don't start pulling up the word and thinking you need to get something else and I need to do something else and I, and I, and I, if I, if I don't, if I don't, if I, and I gotta, ooh, I gotta call 3,000 prayer partners to get on this. Man, you need to think about your root. I got a root system that goes down deep. I've been planning the word for years. That's right. Hallelujah. Keep on bearing fruit. Hallelujah. Colossians chapter 1. Let's look at verse 12. Still in Amplified. It says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified and made us fit to share the portion which is the inheritance of the saints, God's holy people in the light. He says that he qualified us. He made us fit. Yes. We're ha not having to qualify. We are already qualified yes. uh, to take advantage of everything that God has for us. Let's look at uh, Titus. Titus chapter 2. He's already qualified us. It says in verse 14. I think I want to read this out of the New King James. It says, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. He said that Jesus Christ gave himself up for us. He redeemed us from all of the sin and the shame. He said, I redeem you from all of that stuff. I did this to qualify you 
so that you will be people zealous for good works. I mean, after all, everything that I did for you should cause you to be zealous to do other things, to do good things, because I'm in a good place. You know how when you, everything is, you feeling pretty good about yourself, you, you want to do stuff for other people. At least you ought to <laughs> want to do stuff for other people. Because didn't I tell you before that God loved gracious people? And if we're going to, if we're going to uh, live our lives thinking rich and living wealthy, we got to learn to be gracious people. And he said, I positioned you so you can be gracious. I positioned you so that you will be zealous. You want to do good works. You want to help. Right. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Do we need to talk about that or something? I mean, we're supposed to be zealous for good works. I know think rich, live wealthy, some people kind of turn that inward and say, oh, man, I'm fixing to get stuff. I'm fixing to get stuff. He says, no. Um, I have purpose in mind. He said, I called you with a purpose in mind. I planted you with a purpose in mind. I want you to uh, see yourself the way I see you because I see purpose. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let's look at Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 4. We're going to look at verse 20. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 20, it says, But the Lord has taken you, and he's talking about uh, uh, his people uh, and what, he, what his desires are and where he's, where, he's, where he's placed them and how they should look. He says, But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace out of Egypt to be his people and inheritance as you are this day. He said, I took you out of that slavery. I took you out of that. He says, so that you could come into an inheritance that I have for you. He said, furthermore, the Lord was angry with me. And this is Moses. He said, God was angry with me because of you, because of how I treated you. See, because um, when the people, you know, they murmured quite often. But on a, an occasion when they were murmuring, uh, Moses got mad. Moses got upset. And so instead of him doing what God told him to do, he comes down and he, he's, he's mad. So he's got words. Because they, 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 they complaining about the water again. So he got words. And so he's just, I mean, he is just waking them over the coals. And you want grateful people and just, you know, you just, he is just all over the place. But God didn't tell him to do that. He told him to go down and strike the rock and give the people water. But Moses got mad and he started doing other things. So he says, furthermore, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes. Because God loves people. God loves people and he doesn't want leaders treating people any old kind of way. He said, because I want you to talk about my love. Now, I'm not talking about the fact that, uh, like you have children, you love them, but you do chastise them. But in doing so, you're supposed to do it because you love them, not because you are mad at them. Amen. So he's like, he said, so, he said, so God got angry me, with me. He said, for your sakes and swore that I would not cross over the Jordan and that I would not enter the good land which the Lord your God is giving you as an, as, as an inheritance. But I must die in this land and I must not cross over the Jordan, but you shall cross over and possess that good land. He said, take heed to yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God which he made with you and make for yourselves a, uh, make for yourselves a carved image in the form of anything which the Lord your God has forbidden you. So he says, God's going to take you over. He says, God was jealous of you. He was upset with me because of how I treated you and the things that I said about you because he is a God of love and he wants to supply your needs. He, he wanted to supply them with the water. He wanted them to be fed. I mean, he, he had all this in mind before he pulled, uh, took them out of Egypt. And um, he's saying, but there's one thing God don't want you to do. He don't want you to have any graven images. I mean, I don't want you to have any other God before me. I don't want you to place anything else before me. And of course, in here, he's talking about them uh, making images out of uh, 
you know, elements, wood and stone and gold and those kind of things. You all remember the account where Moses went up on the mountain and the people were upset and then they brought the gold, the silver and all this stuff to Aaron. And when Moses asked him about it, he said, you know what? I didn't mold no calf. I just threw it in the fire and it came out like this. It's like, Aaron, that was a mighty smart fire. To, you, th- you just threw the gold in there and it just came out of calf. Because that's what he said. So he was telling them, he says, now God wants to provide for you. God wants to give you everything that you need, all the provisions that you need. You don't need to be looking at anything else but me. So he goes on to say, uh, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. When you beget children and grandchildren have grown, excuse me, when you beget children and grandchildren and have grown old in the land, and act corruptly and make a carved image in the form of anything and do evil in the sight of the Lord your God to provoke him to anger. I call heaven and earth, of course, God is not going to do this stuff to you. (laughs) I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you will soon utterly perish from the land which you which you cross over the Jordan to possess. You will not prolong your days in it, but will be utterly destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. So God is talking to them or Moses is giving them a warning. He's saying, listen here. He said, now God provided for you water in the wilderness. God provided you food. And when you didn't like the manna, then he gave you what you asked for. And then you, got, you ate so much that you got sick and then you didn't want it. He says, so he's been leading and guiding you. Your shoes hadn't worn out. Your clothes hadn't worn I have provided everything that you absolutely need. Now, why is it that you would start now worshiping something that can't do anything for you? I mean, if you read this, read this chapter, he started talking about, so when you get an image, the only thing you do is just sit there. He said, what can it do? You can pray to it, but it's not going to heal you. You can talk to it. It's not going to give you any peace. Only thing it can do is be wherever you put it. (laughs) That's the only thing it can do. So he's saying, don't don't put anybody before me. You know, we talked about the fact that we were setting uh, a foundation We didn't want to jump right in and start talking about, okay, God wants you wealthy. God wants you to have more than enough. God wants you. No, he does want all those things, but God's not going to do that for you unless your foundation is right. Unless you know and make him Lord, make him head of your life, make him be the number one in your life. He said, because I can take care of all that other stuff that trickles down if you'll make me first, if you'll put me first in your life. Let's look at Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 46. Isaiah chapter 46. Let's look at verse 4. And let's look at this um, out of the easy reading version. And God is talking about who he is. He says, and I still will be carrying you when you are old and your hair will, be tur- will turn gray. I will still carry you. I made you and I will carry you to safety. Can you compare me to anyone? No one is equal to me. You cannot understand everything about me. There is nothing like me. God said, there is no one like me. You can't compare me to any human person. You keep... I, There's no comparison. He says, some people are rich with gold and silver. Gold falls from their purses and they weigh their silver on scales. They pay an artist to make a false god from wood. Then they bow down and worship that false god. They put their false god on their shoulders and carry it. That false god is useless. People have to carry it. People set the statue on the ground and it cannot move. That false god never walks away from its place. People can yell at it, but it will not answer. That false god is only a statue. You. It cannot save people from their troubles. He said, there's nobody like me. I can do all of this, but if you, you think something else, inanimate, can get you what you want, can solve your problems, 
He said, then, he said, you're, you're fools. You're, you're foolish. You don't know. I, I read in, uh, was it Revelation chapter 3? He said, you say that I have lots. I have rich. I'm wealthy. He said, but you don't realize that you're poor. He said, because without me, it comes to nothing. So God is saying, we don't put, he said, I've given you a bountiful inheritance as a believer, as a Christian, as one who's coming to the kingdom of God. He says, I have everything that you need. I can supply you with everything that you, I can supply you with everything that you need. And I'll supply you with things that you, you don't even need. Remember in Kings, Solomon, he said, I'll give you what you didn't ask for. Just keep me first. Just keep me first. And that's where God wants us to be. We've come into a bountiful inheritance in him, and there's nothing that he'll withhold from us. God's desire is to lavish great and good things upon us, but understand, God does things with purpose. God said, you know, I'll give you seed to sow, and then I'll give you bread for eating. He said, I'll take care of both of them. I can can handle all of it because there's no one like me. I can do it all. And any problem that you have, I'm the one who's going to solve it. Because a lot of times we think we have a money problem. Sometimes we have something called a spending problem (laughs) or a budget problem. It's not a money problem. Because this this kind of suck is just stood out to me. Pastor Brian was teaching and he said, now, if we say God tells the truth all the time and God says, I'll supply all your needs according to my riches in Christ Jesus, then God has done it. So that must mean there's something going on on your end. Since he's a God and he doesn't lie. He's God and he doesn't lie. Amen. Amen. And this is not to make people feel guilty or anything like that, because I did ask someone concerning, I said, you know, um, people truly do live from paycheck to paycheck. People do, I mean, I, I, I was paycheck to paycheck. I don't even know if, I couldn't even make it to the other paycheck, not really. But, um, and I said, but so how, how do you, I mean, what do you do with people? Like he said, you would not believe how you really can find where uh, people miss, still mishandle money, even when they have very little. He said, but you have to start somewhere. And so people are like, I don't need to do a budget because I don't make much money. He said, he said, most of the time, those people are wasting something. They may think it's not much. He said, but once you get your principles in order, then things will go well for you. Once you get things in order, they go well for you. Then God knows that you know how to handle money. And also, uh, thinking wealthy or rich begins with what you have, not what you don't have. Most of the time when people start talking about rich or wealthy, they start thinking about what they don't have instead of taking inventory of what they do have. Y'all knew we was going to get practical sooner or later, right? We just can't keep going, oh, yeah, you're having a pep rally. Pep rally, yeah, yeah, okay. But, <laughs> but it is true. I... Um, went to a, a, a fundraiser, I guess you call it fundraiser. But anyways, um, I went and they were um, giving out, yeah, fundraiser, they were giving out resources. Uh, this organization was giving out uh, things to different uh, us people and associations and endowments and places. They were uh, 100 shares because they, how much did they give to Embrace and Legacy? $50,000. And there was a lady who got up who said, I'm so happy to be a part of this group. Um, To be a part of it, you uh, have to buy in at $1,000. And so what they their intention was to get at least 50 women, 100 women, to give $1,000 so they'd be able to give out $100,000. Very simple, simple plan. And she got up and she said, they allowed me to go with them. She said, because when, they, when I first heard about it, she said, I couldn't do anything. She, I, didn't have any, I didn't have any money. I didn't have any money to give, but I wanted to so bad. 
She said, first year went by, and she said, I, I still wasn't in a place where I could give. I was barely making it. She said, but then I decided to get my finances in order. I decided to set up a spending plan and, this, and, and set some things up so that I knew where my money was and stopped wasting money. She said, I didn't have a lot of money. She said, two years went by. I still wasn't in a position. She said, but I want you to know, this is the third year, and I can give as much as I want. Amen. I can give as much as I want. So you see, God has brought us into an inheritance, but you have to handle the inheritance properly. You know, you can get an inheritance. It can be a lot, a lot of money and a lot of stuff. But if you mishandle it, you'll be like those people who win the lotto. Two years later, you'll be like, what? how in the world could anybody spend all that money? Mismanagement. Not being good stewards. Buying whatever I want because the money is there. I'm not going to get any amens. I'm not going to get any. I'm not going to get a. That's right, Pastor Deborah. That's right. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get you to the point where you was like, I got to do something about this. I got to do something. I got to do something about this because I want to be at a place where I can give in every good work and charitable donation. I want to be at the place, God, where I don't need any aid or assistance because that's where God wants us to be. But we have to be good stewards over whatever is in our hands. Hallelujah. Somebody say, preach, Pastor Deborah, preach. Because I'm going to be the person in 2 in, in Corinthians chapter 6, 6, 9, thank you, 9, verse 6, and on down. <laughs> God's going to multiply my seed song. Amen. I'm going to keep God first. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. And when God tells me that I cannot serve two masters, I'm going to say, that's right, God, because God is master. Hallelujah. And you know, we really, we really do want to, we, don't, we want to help out. So we're going to Offer some classes to help you get to where you need to be. Are, are y'all already set? Am I, am, I, am I preaching to the choir? Y'all already set. Y'all already got it together, huh? <laughs> Somebody say, yeah, no. <laughs> but that's where God wants us to be. That's, where, that's, that's his whole plan. He says, you come into an inheritance and coming into an inheritance, he said, there's some things that you qualify for. You qualify for. And it's time for us to stop just singing and clapping about being qualified. You know, that's just like them telling you, you qualified for a house and you never go buy one. And the only thing you keep showing everybody is, see my qualifications? I'm qualified to get a house. Did you, did you go get it? Well, no, I haven't gotten it yet, but I'm qualified. Praise Jesus. You're making songs about you qualified and... <laughs> <laughs> I can go get I can go get any I can go get any house I want, but you're still living in a box somewhere, but I'm qualified. Look. So we gotta stop waving the Bible in the air saying I'm just qualified. But we waving the Bible in the air because we're like, hey, oh, I'm living a good life. Hey, ho. <laughs> I'm living out. And like I said, we have a tremendous inheritance that God has given us. And uh, the biggest thing is that God called us and decided to be our, our God. Yeah. And he wanted us to be his people yeah. so that he could lavish his love upon us so that we can live a victorious life. So it all begins right there. Yeah. And understand it begins there and it ends there. Yeah. When we say get saved, we say make Jesus Lord of your life. And people hear I guess I go to heaven. But God says, no, I want to be Lord of your life. That's why he was talking to the people of Egypt like this, the children of Israel that came out of Egypt. That's why he was talking to them like this. He's like, listen, I'm 
I'm your God. Nothing else should come before me. I'm your God. See me as your God. When you see me the way I am, then you can depend on me to be who I am. But if you don't see me for who I am, then you can't take advantage of who I am. Hallelujah. So we got to put him in the right place. Amen. Thank you for watching the message today. I pray it was a blessing to your life. Remember, you can always like and subscribe to our page and be notified when new messages are available. Have a blessed day.